Okay, so um, hello everybody. Uh, we're going to be starting our first scheduled workshop exactly an hour late. Um, so this will be the iOS seven with Swift and Swift UI workshop that we have here. It is going to last. I'm not sure how long, but let's start off with Swift and Swift UI. We're going to start off with Swift language fundamentals. And I'll talk to you through a to-do list app in Swift UI. Yeah, we're going to do a demo app of a to-do list. So uh, here we go. going to dive right in. All right. Yeah, so, uh, okay. so here is a brief tour of the Swift programming language. So have any of you coded in Swift before? No? Yes? Yay, OK. Wait, so have any of you done iOS? No, not iOS. Uh, no. Xcode development? No? No. OK. So let's go ahead and uh, do a brief tour of the language itself. So these are some uh, general uh, operators in the language. Uh, this is just for, for reference. So uh, if, if you want, we can uh, have to slide back. But first of all, we're just going to go um, go to the next slide. And also, that's a polo. So. So um, Java is the language that is taught at this institution for their intro CS course. So uh, let's go ahead and see how we define uh, four different types of values here. Um, so we have number, integer. But this is the, so in Java, the value type goes before the variable name, and then you just assign it to a value. So I, I believe all of us is taking CSE 140x, I think. OK. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's just go ahead and move right on to Swift. So in Swift, all variables, you have to have this uh, var keyword. You have to have this var keyword. They are a variable. If it's a constant, it will be a let. The equivalent in Java will be static final. Yes. OK. And right here, followed by the variable name. And now, this is the variable type, as you can see here. And it is separated by a column between the variable name and the type. And then, in the end, we go ahead and Go ahead and just assign it to a value. And the other thing about Swift is that it has type inference. So you don't have to declare its value type, unlike Java. So I can say var number equals three. It's automatically going to assume that by three, I mean an integer. But if I go ahead and do double, oh, it's going to know that's a double. And right here, if I say emoji equals true, then it's going to automatically go, hey, choose a boolean. I'm going to set this to a boolean. So this is uh, type inference in Swift. And then we have some string concatenation stuff here. Um, so in Java, I believe in CSE 142 and 143, they, they, never, they didn't teach how to have strings as a variable in Java. But in Swift, how you would do it is if you have a string here, you have another string. And or well, you can actually just do this plus this. What? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you can do just this plus this, you know, the, the way with that, the 142 and 143 is teaching it. However, I think mean, Java you can also do that, but I'm not entirely sure what 142, what this, this school's course is teaching. But in Swift, if you want a search string, you can just go ahead and do a string here. And you can just fill out wherever you want this string to be with this slash, parentheses, the variable name. So what this will, what this will print out, not print out, what does you do? OK, so fruit.pen. So it's going to replace that with apple and that with pen. So it's going to replace exactly where that is with the variable, the string of the variable name. So let's go ahead and go fruit equals fine apple. OK, so here we reassign the variable fruit to the string pineapple. And now we print a string. Like this is a variable pen plus this fruit. So basically, wherever this is present, you replace it with the string that, that, that this variable is referring to. Or you can just do string plus string plus you know, uh, the way that 143 and 142 was teaching it, which also works. And uh, that's 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 his face, I guess. So this is a standard for loop in Java. You have 
a starting integer, you have a condition, and you have an implementation. Not implement, yeah, an action that it does every single iteration. In Swift, a, sw a loop will look something like this. It will be for i in the starting index, minus not starting index inclusive, and index uninclusive, exclusive. So, next up we have Java. Yep, this is a similar, but this is a similar for loop, but instead of going from going up, it goes down. In Swift, it will be something like this. For I in start to end, and you just put your group. Instead of doing it got reversed. But, okay. This... I believe this was not this has not been taught in 142 or 143, but basically what it's trying to do is it defines a starting, which is a double, and then the condition, and then you can increment it not by an integer, you can terminate for whatever increment you want. And then in Swift, it wouldn't be like this actually. This is deprecated, so it is currently this. In stride from the sorting index to the end index by increment. And the i is a double in this case. Okay. Put it, put it, put it. Function and method. So we're going to go ahead and talk about function and method. Oh my god. Talk this up a bit. Function and method. Now, this, this is kind of this, this is kind of messy, so I'm just going to. Can I just show them that? Okay, I'm just going to. Okay. This is kind of messy, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go ahead and skip to. Uh, yeah, right here. So, a function in Swift is defined by the func keyword, and this is the function name. Oh, a function is is in Swift is a method in Java because it's an encapsulation of a bunch of code that executes a particular task. So we have the func keyword. We have the name of the function. We have the name of the argument, ignore this for now. We have the name of the argument, and then this is this, and then the type of the argument, which is the same way we declare a variable. Uh, right here, this is this come this is what it returns. Now it is important to know that the, all these suites means the same thing, because void means the same as this. And if it's returning nothing, you can you can just have nothing here. This is the this is the um, the body of the, of the function itself. Now what this underscore thing does is I'm just gonna go ahead and go to the next slide. This underscore thing does. Go back. Okay. Whoa. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so so what so what this underscore thing does, because in Swift, if you have a function that's intaking a parameter. It will be like this. So, so this this parameter is called two. It is oh, that's yeah. argument label. Yeah, two is the what, argument. What's the name? What's the name? It's the list name? is the parameter. Okay. Name. List is the parameter name. What did you do? What? Isn't this supposed to like? You, so all this, right. This omits the name. Yes, this omits the argument label. Down there, there's an example of that. So, okay, I'll take this slide. <laughs> so, uh, in Swift, the according argument uh, methods are actually a little different. You will have something called argument label, is you add it in front of the very uh, parameter you are passing in. So, for example, the here we are adding an object to an array. Uh, in this case, for it, this reads rather smoothly in English. Uh, to show that effect, we can use an underbar to indicate we don't want any argument label for this first parameter. So when you call it, you just say add object. But for the list variable, we have a two as an argument label. That's why we need to say add object to array. That way we indicate you are doing that. Well, I think I think what you did here, this is a name, right? That's I argument think, label. Is, that's parameter. You, you, said, you said the type is an in out type. Yes. So in out is rather oh, interesting in Swift because you can actually change uh, any reference to pass in or a value pass in. In Java, you can't do swap to ints with a method, but in Swift, you can do that with in out parameter. 
you just add an ampersand in front, it's kind of like C++ uh, pointers. You can manipulate that oh. that way. And any just says you can be any element you store. Okay. Default about wait, what did you put yeah. a default? Yeah, oh god, what did I do? Function as parameter, but that's okay. Completion equals no. Boop. Boop. So why Swift? Well, what else, what other language? Actually, you can use it. You can use React Native, but um, no. But this is mainly comparing Swift between Objective C and Java, though. Yeah. Should I talk about Swift compared to like React and? Sure. Alright. So 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 first, so first first we follow the slide and we and we and we look at Java. So I mean Java. I guess we 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 couldn't really blame Java for this because Java is generally known to be a hassle just to print out "Hello World." Like many languages, Swift, for example, Swift and you know Python included, not C is just print "Hello World." Yeah, so again, we can yeah, so that's pretty simple uh, way of printing out stuff. Objective C is the uh, the old um, probably programming language for. Uh, the Xcode development, but it's it was replaced in twenty four not replaced it was Swift was introduced in twenty fourteen so before that it was all Objective C but right now it's twenty nineteen so I guess we wouldn't talk about Objective C that much. Expressions Java versus Swift so right here we have a difference between uh, creating a new instance of a class between Java and Swift so. What is the key here is that Swift has, and this is not just for creating a new class, this is the same for functions if yes. you don't put the lower score thing. So if you don't put the lower score thing, any functions, any any word that requires parameters, you, ha you have to have the name and then its value. And the name, it does, the it does, argument label. Yeah, and also if you're developing it in Xcode, it's going to fill all this out for you, so you don't actually have to remember what the name is. So it gives you a nice reminder. Mm, where are we at? Java is with let l equals to mutating, non mutating. Okay, so here we have a string in string Java, and then we have a uh, string dot two uppercase. And is, does this mutate the string? No, right? No, it no, returns a new Java string. It returns a new string, right? Yes. Or it returns you a new string. You see, that's the problem with uh, Java. Yeah, so. so that is the thing with Java. Now, of course, right down here, down here is Swift. Down here is Swift. So L equals array dot sorted. So this sorts the array, but it returns it to a new array, and the array itself doesn't change. However, if we call array dot sort, it sorts the array itself and it changes and it doesn't return it. Okay. So that that is quite clear. But I would have strict. Alright, so go to that's a strict in this thing. So, one thing that I have to mention is, I don't think, okay, like, there are many languages that doesn't implicitly do the type conversions. For example, Swift, for example, Python, Java's not one of them. So, I just feel, this is, yeah, this is a, a very handy thing, especially when you're trying to, trying to concatenate multiple variables together. Because the reason that Java doesn't have this it's the only reason why there is 10 points worth of expression questions on the CSC 142 midterm stash final. Like, in any other language, that part wouldn't have been possible because it just wouldn't, it either wouldn't compile or wouldn't run. So you, you can't, anytime you want to do concatenation of any sort, you have to specify what type the, val the, 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 the value is because it will never try, try to guess what value is. And then you end up in Java, like concatenating random stuff together. Type of variable can be changed after declaration. Well, this That's is uh, uh, unless unless you do any. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. You yeah. still of type any though. You don't change it on the type. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's still of type any. That's right. That is right. Okay. So this is a uh, quite handy too. Optional. Uh, so, so Swift being a development language, it has this system called optional, which is that if a, a variable 
can, can be a no. You have to declare it as an optional variable. Now, what, what happened here is that the explanation, the explanation mark here is what we call forced unwrapping. So what it means is, doesn't matter if it's a no or doesn't matter if it's a nil or not, just give me the value. This is forced unwrapping. So this is typically only used when you know that the value is not going to be nil. But, but mostly, most of the time it wouldn't be nil. So I guess that's good. Safe slash strict error handling. Yeah, this is just a general error handling code. Uh, let's see. What is the useful stuff? Oh, oh. So, um, one thing I do have to mention about the device with Twitter is, in mobile software development, you, you can there's often many ways to do it. For example, the way that we are running our workshops today is we have native solutions, which is Xcode and Android Studio. That's what was commonly referred to as native solutions because you're building them separately on the um the the IDEs and frameworks provided by the. Uh, the makers of the software itself. There are, are cross-platform solutions, um, such as React Native, which is, React Native is, is mostly designed to be building web mobile apps, because it's both based on, it's, based, it's, it's basically built in a way that allows web developers to make their web into a mobile version of Yeah, and that's React Native, that is cross-platform. Something else is called Flutter, and that is, that is also cross-platform. It's it's often what, what language does Flutter on? Apollo. Dart. What? Dart. 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 Yeah. Dart. Okay. But they have some problem with lists. They don't have cellular reuse, so your list is very slow when you have many elements in there. And so that's that's the other thing that you can do cross-platform, and then and then if you're developing like. Things like games, I guess you have like all the game engines, Unity, Unreal, they can all build cross platform. So, but one of the things with cross platform is I think a common thing that's usually said about cross platform is if you draw a, 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 a graph of where, where the X is project complexity and Y is effort required, if you use native solution, it's a linear growth. If you use uh, non-native solutions is often an exponential growth. So what will usually happen is, if you have a linear function and an exponential function, for the initial part before they intersect, the exponential is going to be lower than linear, which means that, that in that sweet spot, cross-platform is probably better. And in that sweet spot, what it usually is is a web version of, of, a, of a website on mobile. But after you get after you get past the intersection, after you get to like complicated stuff like machine learning, you want to use like AR on the device. You want to use on-device capabilities. You want to interact very closely with device hardware. The cross-platform gets you know grows exponentially. You want the other one grows linearly. So that is that is what I think. I guess what we said about the subject is that if you if you're in that sweet spot, you know, if you're trying to turn your website into a web app that doesn't necessarily interact with the hardware on that complex of a level. If I can have a sweet spot, you know, in the cross platform is, is quite nice because you know there's less effort required. But if you want to go deeper into your project, especially if initially you release it, it might be in that sweet spot. And as you build it up, it might get more and more complex. And then maybe you'll find out that to a point where you kind of have to rebuild it in native solution. So, well, I guess for games, it's different because if you're using a game engine, it's always going to be that game engine. So, that, that's the other thing. Um, so I would say that, yeah, that's the general thing for non-game applications. That's the thing about native development, and that's the thing we're doing today because we have both separate Xcode and Android Studio. So, yeah, so you have, you can develop for the entire, uh, I guess, family of softwares. There's no TV up here, but you know, also develop for TV. Um, that's Linux. Yeah, so Swift also does run on Linux and also web for a certain amount of certain purposes. And uh, compiler. There's much more, there's much, much more compilers. Now, if you search online, you can probably find one, but this is uh, Swift fundamentals and the reasons of Swift. All right. So, one thing I would like to mention before we move on is Swift on Linux. You can actually have a web server 
written in Swift. Uh, and there are many things in native Swift right now, so you should give it a try if you're interested. And now let's move on to the second half of our presentation. Is we'll write a to-do list app with Swift UI. So let's first look at what a to-do list app should look like. Here we have an iPhone simulator. If you haven't downloaded Xcode, you should do that now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. So this is a reminder app. On the top, we have a name of your list. So you can add stuff to your reminder, like hello, this is to-do list. And you can mark things off. You can delete them as you wish. And that's basically, and you can edit the to-do list item after you added it. So we're going to build something similar to that. This is what we're going to be building today. So you also have the same functionality. You can uh, check, uncheck. You can add a new to-do list item to it. You can delete them. You can bulk edit. And so first thing we should do is have Xcode. What we're going to do is we'll create a new Xcode project. We'll select single view application. So here we have a product name. Why don't we call it to do list app? And then here the team, you don't possibly you have none as your uh, team, but if you have Apple account, you can do that. Organization name, you can just do your own name or thing you want. Organization identifier is your personal domain, but if you don't have one, it's totally fine. You can do like my name is Apollo u.edu. So what we do is reverse this. And that's our organization identifier. The language is Swift. The user interface is Swift UI. Make sure you select Swift UI because otherwise you have storyboard. That's not what we want. You can uncheck all of those. And let's click next. We can just save it anywhere on your Mac. You don't need to create a Git and don't add it to any workspace. And we'll create our new project. So this is the procedure we'll follow for today. So first, we have all the features planned out, what we're going to need for our to-do list app. And now we have seen our UI design, but let's start with the simple stuff. So when you have this, you should have both things on the sides. Can you see my? Yeah, we'll have a presentation light. OK, now we can properly see this. On your screen on the left is your code editor. And on the right, you have a preview. Click that resume button on the right. And you will see hello world, hopefully soon. All right, hello world. And now when you change something there, you will actually see a real time preview on the right. Now let's look at how our to-do list app should look like. To-do list app. OK. So for to-do list, one basic item we have is a row of text. So why don't we make something like a title? Uh, let's do our lovely little um, variable here. We learned before our title equals title. And here text, we just say text title. And click the resume button again, and you will see our to-do list item on the right. On the left, we have a circle. And when we click on it, it turns into that. How do we want to do that? So first, you see those two align on the same thing. And to place two items on the same line, we use something called an H stack, which means you put something horizontally in a stack. And then we can add something called an image. So that circle on the left, we actually implement it using an image. We tell, we tell it to construct using a system name. So here, what we will be using is called SF Symbols. There is an app on, the apps, uh, on Apple's developer website that shows you an entire list of Swift, um, SF Symbols you can use. Here, if you just search circle, we can see that there is an empty circle. Um, all right, let's just assume there's an empty circle somewhere here. 
that it's actually going to work. We can see that. So just type circle. And you should be able to see here we have a circle and our to do list item. Now we should change our image to use based on if the item is selected uh, or is completed. We give a variable, uh, we first make it false. Our to do this item is not completed when we first write it. So we're use, um, if it's completed, uh, we will use a different image. Uh, I believe is there's a check mark dot circle dot fill. And if you click the resume again, of course, you will see that same little empty circle right now because it's R is completely is false. But when we change that to true, we should see it change to a um, failed demo. Uh, we need to click the resume button again. Uh, all right. You can see that although a little tiny, we have a little circle there uh, with that. And let's, why don't we make it larger? If you add dots right after your image, that modifies your image. Uh, we, call, we call it to become larger. And your circle just become larger. That's the interesting about Swift UI is you can add modifiers after your things and they're going to change accordingly. And why don't we add a little tint color to it? So I think it's called foreground color. So this, this will set the color of your uh, little image. When it's completed, we're going to make it um, green. How about that? And if it's not, we'll make it as the same color as all the primary text we have, which is black. So now you see our little uh, symbol becomes green. Great. So now that is a row of our to-do list item. Well, to-do list, there are many to-do list items in there. So what we're going to do is we'll make this two a separate type. In Swift, um, when you have a data type, it's recommended you call it. We can you can you can do a class that's called to do list item, but I'm not going to uh, use a class because it's a data type. We should make it struct. So it's uh, struct offers many advantages, and I'll talk about them as we walk through this. And we just copy paste we are the code we had before. In there and title is something we can change is completely something we can change your code doesn't compile right now but that's totally fine um, actually we'll declare the type parameter here bar is completed it initially is false what's going to happen here is we don't have our to do this item anymore so we'll have to make an array of to do's of type and to do item array of to do item and we set it empty, uh, to an empty list before, uh, initially. And then we have, so what we're going to have is here, this doesn't compile now, but that's totally fine. What we'll have is a list. So a list displays a list of items. And we, for each item in our to-dos, we're going to display a row for that. If item is completed, we do that and we display items title in the text. Well, this doesn't quite compile yet because if you want to for each on something, it requires it to be identifiable. So what we're going to do now is we say this is something that's identifiable. For it to be identifiable, you need, must have an ID. So we're going to say let ID means it's a constant after you make an item. Uh, it should be constant. And we say UUID. That way, it just automatic generates a new ID for our to do this item when we create them. And now, oh, yeah, I forgot to add item is completed here. After that, our code should be good enough and we should be able to see it. When we, once we resume, we have an empty list because we don't have any to do's here. Well, why don't we create some right now? To do item, we can just pass a title. Oh, yeah. Remember that argument label again. Hello. Oh, you need a comma to separate your element in your array. Item title completed. Uh, world is true. And now uh, I'm low on power. 
to resume. We can say on the right, we have something that's completely broken because I forgot to embed this in an H stack, which put them in the same row. Okay, now we have our working to do these rows. Yay, not much lines of code. So now the next functionality we want to have is to be able to all right, let's check off things. You have UI design. We learned how to modify some views and modifiers. But OK, let's right now add another thing that allows us to add new entries to this list. So here in the list again, after the for each, we're going to have um, each stack again, because we're going to have two things in there. One, we're going to copy this image. Because remember, in our finished app, there is a little symbol in front of the new to-do list item. We don't have an item, we just have a circle in this case. And we also make large, we make foreground color. I remember is sys color system um, gray 3. And we're going to have another thing called text field. Text field allows users to input some text. And let's see what constructor it has. So we're going to select the second one. It takes the title. We're just going to say new to do item. And next is binding. I'm going to talk about that later. On editing change, we don't care about that. And on commit, when you double click on that, we're going to see our to do's should append a new to-do item. Uh, what's going to go in there, we're going to talk about next. So here, there is something interesting called binding. To fill a uh, parameter that requires binding, we're going to declare a new state by saying add state uh, variable new to-do item, uh, item title of type string. We're just going to set it to empty because the new to-do this item defaults to empty. And here we're going to prefix it with a dollar sign and new to do item title. And here we make a new to do item, uh, use the same constructor, say new to do item title. So now, try again. Why does this not compile? Huh? Why is this happening? So interesting thing here is we're trying to modify to do, but it's not mutable because it's not part of our state. Now if we mark that as part of our state, this thing should compile perfectly and it should work. Yay, now we can try again. If you click that little triangle button on, the, on there, you should be able to interact with your app right now. And you should be able to type something. Hello world there. Oh, we have a bug here. We didn't clear our need to do item title to empty. And if we uh, we need self in front of it. And if we refresh there. There we go. We are now able to add stuff to our list. So that's cool. Now, mm, let's check off more stuff. Um, stacks identifiable. We kind of have handling events. Let's talk more about that. So here, image. One, we one feature we have is when you click on it, you should be able to toggle. After we set the foreground uh, color, we say on tap gesture. That means whenever you tap it, we can flip the st state of it. We're going to say, um, huh, this is going to be a little interesting. So to do is, we cannot just say item dot is completed um, dot toggle because item is not mutable in this case. Yeah, what we have to do instead is we need to find the index of this thing in the array, and if let um, so index 
um, to do the index first index of oh you see we have this weird thing here because our thing is not uh, Swift cannot automatically figure out where our thing is. All we need to do is add an equatable conformance to this. And now Swift is able to just help us find the index of our to do this item. Our little exclamation mark and to do's. We pass that index in there. And we set this completed to toggle. So now if this compiles. Possibly no, so I just fix it myself. And we try again. And now when we click on those buttons, we should be able to toggle. Great. That's another feature we have implemented. But what's next? So next we'll embed this into oh, I can close that now. Next thing we have, we have handle events, animations. Do we have animations right now? Yes, we do. Okay, cool. You see that by adding it to a list, we automatically get an insertion animation there. So that's cool. Oh, cool. Let's see. What if we embed it in a thing called navigation view? So just add a navigation view around all of that. In our finished version of our app, there is a huge to do on top of it. What we're going to do is, uh, where is does this thing end? Okay, if you command click on that, you're going to see where that thing ends. But the one before that, we set its navigation title, bar title to to do. And now we get that huge little to do on top of that. We also have this edit button on top where you can tell it to edit the list. To do that, we just say navigation bar items trading because on the right to be an edit button. And now when you click on edit, it doesn't do anything. Hmm. Why is that the case? Oh, you know why that is the case? Because we didn't tell it how we should edit it. After your for each uh, structure, you can tell it on delete uh, index indices. We can delete the item remove at the first indices we have in there. Yeah, we again we need self. And now if we see this, when we edit, you have this nice little delete on the left. And when you swipe, you get that delete. When you delete, it's deleted. Alright, that's cool. Okay, what's next? So when we see we have, we have delete, the circle is still here, which is kind of annoying. So what we're going to do is to be able to tell our list to hide its uh, image when it's not necessary. What we're going to have to do is declare a new... Wait. I think it's cost. Um, I think it's state right now. Off type edit mode. When we first start it, the edit mode starts as inactive because we are not editing our thing. And now we'll pass that to our little uh, h-stack, telling it you should have an environment for edit mode to be our edit mode. Yeah. And then we're also going to do the same thing. Why it's not compiling? Self so edit mode. Hmm. And we're also going to do the same thing. Yes. We need that dollar sign in front because it requires a binding to our thing for you to be able to change, just like this text field here. When you have a dollar sign in front of it, it's going to be able to automatically modify your variable as needed. 
And here, um, if we say if edit mode is not, actually we cannot do this right now because there is some bug in Swift UI that requires us to improve our code. So what we're going to have to do is click on this H stack here, command click on that, and there's a button called extract subview. So we can help fix Swift UI's bug for them. Uh, we'll call this to do item row. Oh, okay. Now our thing gets a little interesting and doesn't compile. But that's totally fine. So here, we'll declare a thing called edit mode for each of our uh, uh, list item because it's for them. Uh, edit mode. And we're going to mark it at environment because we're passing in the edit mode environment dot edit mode so this will serve as our edit mode here and if our edit mode scroll value a uh, wrapped value is not um, active we'll display this image and here it requires us to have a title, so we're going to say var item here of type to do item. Now once we have that, we can fix this here by adding our missing item here. Now it's complaining about we don't have a to do's here. Hmm. Well, because to do's are only available in our entire list, what we should do is create a new abstraction around this. So we'll make a new class that handles our to-do uh, items. Items. We'll make it observable object, and we'll make this new to-dos be part of that. But this time we'll make it published. By making it published, we're telling Swift UI that whenever this array changes, we should update our view. And now. We can have a new environment object to be our to do the store, and we can call it um, how about database of ta our type to do store. And this thing begins with an empty list. Here, I don't think we need that anymore. And now we don't, of course, don't have access to stores directly. We should say database dot to do's here, and everything should compile except we need it, uh, our database here as well. So we're gonna say environment object var to do store uh, our database of type to do store. And we're gonna need to replace every to dos with self database dot self database dot. So interesting about environment object is it can be automatically passed down from your parent uh, view in your the view hierarchy. Self. Cool. This is compile now. Why does this not compile? Oh, I named this wrong. It should be observable object. And now we need to make this database as well. And this thing should compile as self dot database dot to do dot pen. All right, this now compiles. But if you actually pre resume and preview the code, you'll be you'll crash because you don't give it environment object. So what we need to do is provide an env environment object of to do store. This is for our own preview, and this should now be able to preview with an empty list. We are also gonna copy this line of code and open the file called sing delegate. And add this to our content view on line 24. 
And now our app should be able to run and not crash. And if we resume our code, we should be able to interact with our thing as usual with no problem. With no problem. All right. Yeah, it's still working. We can still mark since that's completed or not. So we're all good. Now the next thing we want to do is to be able to save our thing on disk so we don't lose our to-do these items when we close the app. And now we're gonna do that on this to-do store. So on iOS, there's a say a uh, back um, data saving strategy called user defaults, which is, which is very good for you to save some simple items. So when we construct this to do store in Swift, the constructor name is called init. We're gonna load it from user defaults. Oh yeah, we need a parameter for our int. User defaults standard dot um. Let's see what would be the best for this data. Data for key. So because actually when we save it, we want to save it as JSON file uh, encoding to a data. So that's why we're retrieving a data from it. And key is to just identify what our um, to do these items are stored as. And if we can find some data from that, this is an optional thing from Swift. And we're going to set our to do's to be decoded JSON uh, of type to do item array from the data we just retrieved. However, this thing doesn't quite compile yet. Swift complains I don't know how to convert your to do item to JSON. Well, good question. What we're going to have to do here is just add another interface called Codable to our struct to do item, and this thing should compile. Um, and we need another if let to do equals to try this because of the optional thing we have. Self dot to do's equals to do's. Now this should be able to help us load our data from a disk. And we want to save is whenever our to-dos change, we should save it to disk. We're going to add a braces after our variable declaration. And when somebody set our to-dos, in this deep set, we're going to save it to user defaults. So what we're going to do is if let data equals try JSON encoder, encode, can encode our to-dos, we'll save it to user defaults. Uh, sorry, set set um, whatever set our data for the same key you pass in here, so you can find it later. And now, when we preview, oh, I need to resume. So previously, when you review, you uh, uh, re review uh, preview, you always see this empty state. But now if you type something in there and you stop and you start again, you'll see our to-do list items are saved on disk. And you can load them from, from there. And all the things you have about uh, editing and deleting all still works. Great. Now the lastly, what we're gonna have is to have a detail view. In our finished app, when you click on things, you have this nice little enlarged view, especially for you if your to-do this item is very long title. Uh, let's see, da, 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 da. you don't have the entire uh, width to view that, you can click on the detail. To do, be able to do that, we're gonna embed in this for each in a thing called navigation link. Navigation link. So let's see what constructor it has. We're gonna choose this one with title. Uh, no, with this destination label. 
So when you double click on that label, we can just move our entire, oops, sorry. Actually, we don't want to embed that much. We just want to embed our to-do item row in there. And our destination will be some other things. How about let's just use something we learned before, a text. What's going to have is the same thing, our text uh, title. And now if we preview our app, if it compiles, you should be able to click on it and you get this text. However, this is saying it's a little too small. Why don't we make it larger? To change the font size, you just say dot font. And I'm going to say it should be large title. And then when you preview again, it's fairly large. However, this thing is centered. We don't really want to have that. We want to be able to scroll if it's really, really long. So what we can have is have a scroll view. We embed this text in a scroll view. So now we can we are able to scroll this if it's long enough. Oh, I haven't okay. I haven't implemented the edit feature yet, but that's totally fine. And now it's centered. We don't want to have that, so we want to, to be able to uh, take the entire width as much as possible. We can use this. So what this thing does is it tells it to occupy as much width as possible. We're telling it max width can be infinity. It's and we'll align this to the left, which is leading. Now you say it's aligned to the left. However, that doesn't look quite nice, so we'll add a little padding to our text. And if we refresh, we see this has a little nice padding here. And we don't really have a navigation title here. Uh, that doesn't look nice either. So we'll tell it to have a navigation title. Details. All right, when you have that, you have not have a detail of your thing. And that's a very basic to do this app we have right now. I think due to time constraint, I'm going to stop us here. Does anybody, anybody have any questions I can quickly answer before I move on? All right. So I think we know how we can create views like text. We can modify it with these modifiers, like we can change this file, we can change this frame, we can add a little padding to it. And we have this environment object which allows you to pass down your uh, database without necessarily uh, doing it in your constructor. It gets automatically uh, available to your views that declare it as dependency. We have navigations. We don't have time to cover alert, but that's something you can also do by just adding another modifier that says dot alert. Uh, and you can experiment with that yourself. That's available. We know how to store stuff onto your disk using user defaults. Uh, we don't have time to cover pasteboard, but that's available in the final version of this app. But here, before we end this thing, let me show you one more thing we can do with this. Open your this blue little icon here. So right now we are always almost always running this on our iPhone. What we're gonna have to do is click this Mac button here. And we say enable. Now we can say we can run this app on our Mac. And I need to sign this with my developer account. And it's going to be building. And we will hopefully. Why don't we also run this on iPhone simulator? We got our to-do list app on a Mac. At the same time, we are writing a Swift uh, application for iOS. So that's something cool thing you can do with Swift UI is you can have to-do list app on both your iPhone and Mac with the single code base you have. And now and actually, you can see this to-do list app I'm right, uh, using the entire time is actually the same way you just wrote. And now let's move on to the next thing. Actually, someone open-sourced a project called Swift Web UI, 
It allows you to take the same code base and develop it as a web app. So that basically means if you know Swift and Swift UI, you can develop for as many platforms as you wish, as long as it's supported. And should we still call ours mobile development club right now? If we can make so many things? Maybe. Well, maybe. So if you want to have this final version of our code, it's available at uh, GitHub. Yes. It's, yes, it's on github.com slash updev slash uh, I don't remember what's the Yes. So if you go to GitHub and UW app dev, you can find the complete version of this to do this app here. It's basically the same thing we wrote, but with a little more features like editing and copying to pasteboard and stuff. All right. And for that, if you want to learn more about Swift, there is a Swift programming language uh, ebook and a website you can look for. There's official Swift UI tutorial and WWDC uh, sessions you can check on Apple's developer uh, website. There are paid and free online courses teaching you more stuff with iOS development, such as Stanford CS1 SVP. And you can join us if you want to actually be able to learn all of this at a um, better paced style, and we, we can work on this together. So I guess for that, thank you for attending this workshop. And all right, any questions?